1 Thessalonians chapter 4 on this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. And I'd like to read from the New King James Version. And I'll read verse 16, 17, and 18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. The Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. Please take a note of that. The dead in Christ will rise first. Now, after that, verse 17, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Where? In the air. Let me read that one more time. After that, after the dead in Christ have rose first, we who are alive will, and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and will meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, I want you to read verse 18 out loud with me, all right? I know we have different translations and different renderings, but as best you can, would you read verse 18 with me? Therefore, come on, encourage each other with these words. Your Bible might say, therefore, comfort or encourage or extol each other with these words. Thank you so very much on this morning. I want to preach for the next few moments, and I might teach more than I preach today, but I want to preach and teach from the message entitled, Encouraged for the Encore. Encouraged by, that is, the Encore. Let me try that one more time. Encouraged by the Encore. Would you say that with me one time? Say, encouraged uh -huh. by the encore. Praise ye the Lord. Now, this morning, I, I, we want to conclude uh, this morning, and thank you so very much, Brother Crawford. Amen. We want to conclude this morning this series that we began a few weeks ago called Signs of the Time. Signs of the Time. And we wanted to take a deep dive and a look at the last days. What, do, what is this whole end time or last day conversation about? Obviously, we see things that are happening in the Middle East. We see things that are happening with Israel. We see things that are happening in our own country and uh, the, from the Old Testament to the New uh, from the Gospels all the way to Revelation one strand is common the Bible says that we ought not be ignorant that we ought not be without knowledge concerning the end days right I'm going to take about a third of my, my time today to review what we've learned thus far I'll take another third and discuss what it is that the Lord is speaking this morning. And then the final third of my time today, I want to make sure that we are all fully active, fully engaged, and fully prepared for the season and the hour that we live in. Now, those things being said, we made a commitment to take a very careful, a very critical, and a very crucial look at what the Bible says. Someone say that would be the Bible. What the Bible, we're not talking about the online commentary. We're not talking about all of the uh, social media influencers. We're not even talking about the, the TV preachers and all of the uh, podcasters. But what exactly does the Bible say about the end times, the sign of times? Now, from a theological perspective, the word is eschatology. Eschatology. When you get back to work tomorrow, you all can impress some of your friends with this long word. Eschatology. It is simply the study of the last day, the study of the end times. My whole objective these past few weeks is that you, the believer, would be educated, that you'd be equipped and empowered to give an answer and understand the importance of being prepared. Let me just underscore that one more time. Instead of just kind of capitalizing on CNN and Fox News and some of you all's curiosity, the whole objective these past few weeks, right, is that you're prepared is that you're prayerful, that you're watchful as you see what I'm gonna call the labor pain, the birthing pains. I don't think we're at the end of days, but I do believe we're at the beginning of the end of days. There's a difference and I'll review that in a moment. But this morning, what does it really mean to be encouraged by the encore, encouraged? by the encore. I really enjoyed last Sunday, by the way, and once again, I'm not just promoting and marketing and advertising the app. Uh, it's free of charge, first of all, but I want, you to be, I want you to be able to go back and review the Word of God in written form with an outline, all right, and also in, 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 in video form so you can hear and see if you missed it. Hey, we're not here to make you feel condemned or guilty. Just go back and listen to the message and watch the service, and when you do watch it, you're going to be so inspired. It's going to be so informative. You're going to want to share it with people. Just hit the share 
button on your phone and share it or email it or, or message it or whatever you got to do. Because we really look at critically the question, what happens when a man dies? What happens when a woman passes away? We like to use the words a little softer, right, when we say they fell asleep. But and, and however you fancy, it, the reality is that we have to have a full understanding of heaven, hell, and then there's a place called paradise. There's a place called paradise. You're already looking at me like, well, ain't heaven paradise? Ain't paradise heaven? Well, 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 time out. If we want to get really technical about it, we look at scripture. Jesus gave a parable. Remember now, parable was something that kind of hid from the lazy, but it exposed to those who were diligent. When he gave this parable, he talked about a rich man. Uh, this rich man died, but he had five brothers. You all remember the rich man? He, he, he was very wealthy. He lived in luxury every day, and he also had five brothers. But Jesus also put a part of the parable, a poor man. His name was Lazarus. Remember, not the same Lazarus that was his best friend who lived in Bethany. This particular Lazarus was a poor man. We know that, in John, we know that his body was full of sores, and he lay daily at the rich man's gate. One thing these men both had in common, they died. They both died. And uh, it's quiet this morning like it was quiet last week when I said that. The reality is we all are going to die. Oh, boy. Uh, it's going to be tough sledding today, I see. <laughs> the reality is we all are going to die. Uh, please realize if Jesus delays his coming to the earth, and if you keep living in this earth, there will come a day when you will have breathed your last breath. Um, uh, it's going to get a little hard here. Uh, since you already acknowledge that, you might as well already acknowledge as well, there is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a heaven. Whether you say amen or not, it still doesn't change the fact. There is a heaven and there's still a hell. We took time these last couple of weeks to talk about judgment. Judgment. What is really judgment? And by the way, remember now, this is not Michael A. Stevens' commentary. This is not Michael A. Stevens' deep divine revelation. I got at three in the morning after I eat a second plate of turkey uh, 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 dressing and cranberry sauce, all right? This is based on what the Bible says, what the Word of God says. In fact, Matthew 24 reminds us, verse 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Jesus said, uh-huh, verse 44, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because I need you to stay off the internet for everybody who's trying to tell you they know when Jesus is coming back. Okay? Uh, well, I don't get on the internet. Okay, well, stop going to all these different conferences and becoming a conference junkie and going from, from revival to revival, conference to conference, concert to concert, because some barefoot prophet who, who, who has, has nothing to his name has told you he knows when the Lord is coming back. And you with your gullible, naive self will go right over there, take all of your baby uh, infamil money and your diaper money and your preschool money and give it to the barefoot prophet because he told you he knew when. First of all, if you would have stayed in your own Bible, if you would have read your own own Bible, you would have clearly heard Jesus say, no man, no angel, even the son of man himself doesn't even know, only God knows. I think that's important, right? And so we really underscored a couple of things here. We, 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 we talked, to, and I call them the three R's. First of all, we wanted to make sure we had a strong biblical understanding of the return of Christ, all right? You have to know that there will be a return of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Uh, we don't know the day or the time, but what we do know is he will one day have a physical, we're not talking about spiritual or mythical or mystical, but there will be a physical return to the earth. Number two, there's the resurrection of the dead. Three R's, return, resurrect, and rapture. They're all different. The return of Christ, and then there's gonna be the resurrection of the dead right if you're living you won't be resurrected only those who have died i don't care if it was old testament new testament in the 1300s the 1900s or 2021 if you died right there is going to be a resurrection now here's something interesting both sinner and saint will be resurrected at that time okay uh, let me help you out real quick first thessalonians 4 13 once again we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with him in the cloud to meet the lord in the air that is the great resurrection that we will all one day see. So whether you were scattered into the sea because of an explosion, whether you were buried and embalmed, and uh, hey, listen, you, you can save some money at the funeral by getting embalmed now, but all them body parts is gonna have to come back together again. Why? Because something important will happen for the people of God. Someone say the return of Christ. Come on, say the resurrection of the dead. Now the rapturing, third R, the rapturing 
of the church. The word rapture comes from the Greek word parousia, or the caught up. And so that being said, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all changed. Watch this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump will sound. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So there's a resurrection of the dead, or rapture, a resurrection of the dead, but there's also a rapture of both who were dead and those who were remaining in the earth. Revelations 21, 13. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and hell gave up the dead that were in them. Wow, what an interesting thought. And they will be judged, every man concerning his work. So why would the dead be raised? Why we who are remaining in the earth are going to be caught up? Because it's the great judgment. It is the great day of judgment. Now, I won't have time to do it today. You have to go back and look at the sermon from two weeks ago as I talked about the millennium, pre-millennium, post-millennium, mid-millennium, the tribulation. There's going to be seven years of tribulation, right? And we're not talking about someone didn't show up to your party or you didn't get invited to this or you ran a yellow light and you got a ticket. No, that's not tribulation. This type of tribulation, the Jesus said himself, it will be troubles and weary that the world has never seen. Okay? And then there's going to be a millennium reign, a 1,000 year reign of Christ. Again, I don't have time to jump into all of that today, but if you go back and listen to the sermons, you can start piecemealing this end time study together. So there's the return of Christ. There will be a resurrection of the dead, right? And then there'll be a rapturing of the church. Let's go back to that parable Jesus gave about the rich man and the poor man. What did we learn last week about some of these factors, right? Uh, Luke 16, 27. And then he said, I beg you, therefore, here's the rich man talking to Father. Uh, in fact, he was talking to Father Abraham at this point. That's a whole nother Judea, Ju Judaism or Judaism conversation. He said, I would that you would send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. That, 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 that Lazarus, who went to heaven while I'm down here in hell, would testify to those brothers on the earth. Because I don't want them to come to this place called torment, right? And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes from the dead, they will repent. And he said, no, uh -uh. if they don't hear Moses and the prophets... If they won't read their Bibles, they won't listen to no pastor, they won't hear the word of God. The argument was, what makes you think someone from the dead is going to persuade them? What did we learn from Jesus' parable in Luke 16? Number one, when a sinner dies, if you died, if someone dies without the knowledge, the saving grace of Jesus Christ in their lives, they go to a place called Hades or hell. Okay, it is a place of torment. Hell comes to the word Gehenna. Many of you all know I've been to Israel many, many, many times. I've had the joy of taking my kids to Israel. My wife and of course have been there. When you're on the when you're on the when you're on the west, excuse me, the east side of Israel, excuse me, the west side of the city of Jerusalem, there's a very low valley. It's called the Valley of Gehenium. Gehenium. The word Gehenna means Hades. It's the valley, the valley of Hinnom. And 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 every tour we take, every tour God I've ever had always points out you see that low valley on the side of the city well that is traditionally where they would burn trash at they didn't have trash compactors all right they didn't have people coming at five in the morning with the truck take your trash bin and put it back no they took their y'all look at me like I'm crazy just like y'all do in the country they took their trash to the low part and they burnt it right yeah and so and that was the valley the valley of Hinnom and so that depiction in Hellenistic periods came the concept hell or the valley of torment. That's where the word, that's where the concept comes from. But in reality, there is a place called hell. I know we don't like to talk about it. You don't want to hear me preach about it. You'd rather think me, you'd rather be preaching on something different, right? USA Today magazine did a, uh, 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 excuse me, an article. They did a very interesting article about six years ago. And they said that, I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but some, some like 75% of people believe there's a heaven. But those same 75%, only 38% believe that there was a hell. Now, how do you believe that there's a heaven, but there's not a hell? You, you understand? It, it logically doesn't make sense. And so with that being said, Jesus said this in Luke 12 and 5, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after you killing of the body has power to throw you in hell. Now, again, I didn't say that, right? Your grandmama didn't say that. Rev didn't say that. Jesus said this. 
So if you're going to be upset and angry, have some political sway back and forth, you need to have this conversation with the Lord Jesus, right? He goes on to say, I, excuse me, I, I took that scripture out, but I think it's still worthwhile. Uh, Isaiah 5, 14, therefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and the glory and the multitude and the pomp and all that rejoices shall descend into it. What am I doing here? I want to reiterate to every one of you that there's a place called hell. There's a place called hell. Now, um, we, we live in a very politically sensitive, be careful what you say type, oh, you'll offend me, and I'm not going to like you anymore environment. But I could really kill us if you like me or not. I'm just going to preach the Bible and tell you what the Bible says, right? But here's what I will do. Let me help your logic, and let me help your critical thinking and your understanding. First of all, hell was never designed and purposed for man. It really wasn't because and also when you talk to your teenagers and your, your preteen, my mom, dad, why would they make a, why would God, if he's so loving and he's so kind, why would he create hell for man? Hell was never created for man. How, how do you know? Well, here's what the Bible says in Matthew 24, 41. And he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, enter the eternal fire prepared, notice, prepared for the devil and his angels. Are, are, are that okay so far? Am I, am I doing all right, right? So we know that God didn't create this place for man. No, it was created for the devil. If I had time, we could go back to Isaiah. We could look at the devil when he was Lucifer, and he basically rebelled. Not only did he rebel and turn against God, but the Bible says he influenced a third, right? Not five, six, or seven, an entire third third of the angels that were in heaven. Can you imagine the influence that Satan must have had through music? Can you imagine the influence he had for a third of those who had been with the Father for all of eternity to somehow, somehow be seduced and deceived to follow him straight to a place called hell? Jesus prophesied and said, I saw lightning fall from the heaven down. And that was the depiction of Satan leaving the throne of God, going to hell. I, wanna, I, I need to keep moving. Number two, hell is not the final stop for sinners in the ungodly. I, we had a good time last week with this one because you, 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 you had this really thinking hat on as you looked at me as I preached last week. But here's what Revelation 20 says. Wait, well, let me, before I do that, let me underscore that thought again. Hell is not the final stop. Hell is not the end destination for the sinner, All right? Let's see what the Bible says in Revelation 20 and 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to all they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Watch this, listen, listen closely. And death and hell death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done now let's just stop for a moment because I don't I don't want to lose any of you when I when, when I minister this word there has the Bible says in Hebrews that it is appointed man once to die and then the judgment Jesus said in the great day of judgment I will separate the goats from the from the sheep the left and the right, okay? How is all, that, how is all this going to happen if folk had already died? All right? Well, first of all, there's going to have to be a, a, a resurrection of the dead so they can get themselves together and stand before the Lord. Okay? Those who were remaining in the earth, the Bible says, will be caught up for that same judgment day, right? But what about those who went to hell? Or the, you, you use Hades, either way, either way you want to use it, Hades or hell. Well, the Bible says that they're going to have to give up those who are already there. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. Then death and hell were thrown where? I mean, is that what your Bible says? See, it's important for me for you to bring your Bibles to church. Because we got these screens, and that's great, but that could be manipulated. I can sit right here and go on some tangent in my own ideologies and theology and miss what God is saying. But when you bring your Bibles and when you read the Word of God, now it starts clicking and it makes sense. Wait a minute, let's read it again. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. Let's not stop there. The lake of fire is the second death. 
so that lets us know and again it doesn't take a rocket science to figure this one out it lets us know that there is another final destination because hell the bible says it grew every day it enlarges itself every day however it was just a holding place for the final judgment to be concurred that judgment will happen for every man and woman every deed every work every thought everything you and i could have ever done will be brought back before that day of judgment i don't want this sermon to be all about information and facts and aha moments you're gonna have to look within and examine yourself and yeah we may have gotten over on this person and yeah we may have gotten away with what I'm, someone knowing about that situation but every thought every action everything good and or bad will be brought before the lord you know the bible says if the lord was to mark iniquity who could stand the reality is none of us can stand on our most holiest of days on our best righteous days the bible says they are as filthy rags there is only one thing come on say one thing there is only one thing that can wipe away all of our sins only one thing that can be an atonement for all of our iniquities i i, I don't know I, I heard someone talk about this the other day. There's a difference between transgression and iniquities. Transgressions will always be the sin that are publicly and for basically are outside actions, right? But iniquity are sins of the heart. Things that no one may never know about, but it was in your heart. Everything will be brought on that day of judgment. Again, Matthew 5, 29. If you think that this is, you know, a little bit too hard. Well, here's what Jesus says. Once again, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. Wow. Don't sound like the little white Jesus with blue, with blush uh, makeup and nice blonde hair and blue eyes and he's so feminine and soft and he's the Lord. Man, man that, that's not like a whole different Jesus. This is the word of God. All right? So let me recap. For the sinner... For the backslider, for the person who doesn't receive the Lord Jesus and the pardon of his sins. And let me go back to the parable between the rich man and the poor man. Here's a couple of facts. Number one, remember, the rich man said, hey, I'm in this place of torment, and I realize I can't get out of here, but I got five brothers. Can you at least send Lazarus to witness to them so they ain't got to come to this place? And Jesus, in the parable's response was, first of all, there's a large gulf between you and them. Therefore, nobody in heaven is going to be able to go down to hell and nobody in hell is going to have this epiphany and get this jailhouse religion and automatically go to heaven. That's not going to happen, right? And so we're learning some things about the dynamics of what hell and heaven might be like even in scripture. I, I, I need to move forward because my time is going to get, get, get caught up on me. So if that is the case for the sinner, what about the believer? Let me reiterate as I said last week. For the Christian born-again believer, the Bible says, oh boy, ugh, this is going to get a little tight here. The Bible says, based on scripture, based on scripture, based on the consistency of scripture, they are ushered into paradise. They are ushered into paradise. Now, in this particular parable, they call it Abraham's bosom. Read the Bible. They call it Abraham's bosom, right? But the, 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 the typology is very, is very, uh, is, is aligned and is very consistent. For whatever reason, it is a place of, of, of bliss, a place of, 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 of joy. It is a place of peace. This is why we often tell people when a person dies, they fall asleep in the Lord. If you read the scriptures, you often hear throughout the entire New Testament that they fell asleep in the Lord. They fell asleep in the Lord because it, it, it gives this idea that it's a temporary place. But once again, until the judgment. Let, let me give you some understanding real quick. I want to move through this. So paradise, say that with me, paradise. Paradise in scripture refers to a heavenly place where believers will go when they die. Paradise. Is a heavenly place or a, a, a beautiful heavenly place of peace where believers go when they die. 
Let me give you three marks that I did last Sunday. Number one, the thief on the cross with Christ. You all remember when Jesus was on the cross before he, he died, that, he breathed his last breath, gave up the ghost. The Bible says he said it was finished. There was a guy to the next, to the right, and there was someone to the left. Remember the conversation, Luke 23, 42. And he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Don't you all remember that good, that good Easter message, right? You remember the Easter message, right? Where the thief said, God, I don't know if you the real deal or not, but all I know is this, if you are the real deal, remember me when you go into heaven. What did Jesus say to him? Jesus answered and said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Come on, say paradise. paradise. All right, let's go to the second one. 2 Corinthians 12, 3. Paul had a trip to what he called the third heaven. Here's what he said. I know this man, talking about himself, whether in body or part of the body, I'm not really sure. But God knows I was called up to paradise. Called up to paradise. Let me read the third reference. John, the revelator, John uh, Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 and he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to, he, to him who overcomes I will give him to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God some of you look at me like I didn't know that word was in the Bible so many times well this is why you're in church on Sunday morning because you're learning you're being educated you're being equipped and I'm trying to connect some dots here so you realize it is worth living right on the earth it is worth living for the Lord while on the earth now let's put it all together real quick so I can get to this new material just as hell was not the final destination for the sinner paradise will not be the final destination for the believer why well because Jesus said to himself I go away to prepare a place for you John 14 1 and if it were not so I would not have told you in my father's house there are many mansions right not what you see in Valentine not what you see in Lake Norman but what you see is different dimensions this is why Paul said I was in I saw three heavens there were levels dimensions there's something to this whole something's different beyond paradise so when mama passed away when grandma passed away she went into Abraham's bosom she went to paradise. She's still asleep in the Lord because at the judgment, she's going to have to appear again before the Lord. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Revelations 21, verse 1 through 3. The book of Revelation says this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Now, please don't look at me with this doubtful, cynical, I'm not really sure. Don't do it now. Uh-uh. If you believe thus far, keep believing the Bible. God showed John the Revelator something. Not John the Baptist. This is John the Revelator, the one who went to the Isle of Patmos. He saw something. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and God gave me a vision of what the end would be like. We call that the book of Revelation. You got me so far? Here's what it says. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and the sea is no more. And I saw a holy city called New Jerusalem coming down out of the heaven of God, made ready as a bride adorned for the husband. Let me get that thought real quick. And I heard a great voice out of the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and he will be their God. Now, a couple of things can't, we, we talked about last week. Uh, uh, will I see my mama in heaven? Will I see my grandmama in heaven? Uh, the question is yes. You will see them, and you will recognize them. Right. The good news is you will see all of the loved ones who died in the Lord, who fell asleep in the Lord. You will see them in heaven. And that's good news. Tell somebody that's good news. Now, here's what may not be too much good news. It may be some. some. Uh, there'll be no marriage in heaven. OK, you will recognize your wife, but you're not going to be married to your wife. You will recognize, hey, there's my husband over there. He finally did get saved and came to heaven. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but you won't have to go home and cook no fried pork chops for him. Okay, right? <laughs> you will see your loved ones. Because again, let's go back to Luke 16. Jesus, obviously he gave a parable. Paul backs it up. And there's this, there seems to be this consistency throughout biblical thought that people recognized. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Remember, there was, there was, there was uh, uh, Moses, there was Elijah, right? They came from the heavens to the earth and they were recognized so you're going to be able to recognize loved ones in heaven, but you're not going to be married to them. Number one, because Jesus, the bride of Christ, 
and the father, God the father is the consummate marriage. That's the consummate wedding. Heaven is really all about a consummation of the marriage. So there'll be, need, there'll be no need for examples with men or angels because he now becomes the ultimate bride uh, who marries the ultimate groom. Number two, marriage in the earth was for procreation. Basically, a husband and a wife were to come together, which kills the LGBT theory and ideology. Man and wife were to come together naturally. I I'll say it again for, for some of you newcomers. Man and wife were to come together and procreate. Y'all still ain't saying nothing with your politically sensitive self. Man and woman were to come together in marriage and have babies, right? Well, there's not going to be any new babies having babies in heaven, right? Because this book has already been sealed. And so these are some of the things you need to think through. I, I, I know we have our own narratives, but what did the Bible say? Speaking of the Bible, y'all, I got about 10 minutes left. Let me get to the new material this morning. I love 1 Thessalonians. I love 1 Thessalonians, right? Let me give you a couple of things about 1 Thessalonians real quick. Number one, it's the oldest book in the New Testament. You may not know that. Think about it. It's the oldest book. It was written somewhere between 51, 52 AD. So before we got the Gospels, which was in the 80s, right? Before we got all these other wonderful books, Romans and Acts and all that, 1 Thessalonians is the oldest book in the, in, in the New Testament. It was written uh -huh, uh -huh, to the Thessalonian church. A couple of things were going on here. Number one, they were a new church. They were new Christians. They weren't too sure what was going on here. Uh, let me try to help you out. So think about it like this. You got, you got all these excited and new Christians. Jesus has lived. He died. He was buried. He rose, came back, talked to the disciples, gave the commission the book of Acts. And he said, hey, guys, I'm coming back soon. I'm coming back soon. So what did these Christians and Thessalonians do? They quit their jobs. They started just living for the moment. They realized, you know, ain't no need to get a house because he's going to come back. So ain't no need to get no mortgage payment. Ain't no need to go ahead and invest in this and invest in that and do that because he's going to come back really soon. Well, someone got the revelation. Wait a minute. A year, as Peter said, is a thousand days to the Lord. A thousand, a day is a thousand years to the Lord. And a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. In other words, if he said he'd come back any day, that might mean three, five, uh, several thousand years. So now Paul has to write to Thessalonians and say, hey, guys, you may want to go get a job. <laughs> you may want to go ahead and go and get married, have some kids. And here's the Bible way of doing it. You may want to go ahead and get established because, yes, we want to wait for his return, but his return could be a while now, right? So all that being said, Thessalonian church was young. They needed help. They needed to be encouraged. Uh, here's another reason Paul writes to them, because there was tremendous persecution in the land. Not the type of persecution that you and I used to. People were being beheaded because of their faith. People were being sawed in half because of their faith. Things, you know what? Wow. Just what we just saw 50 days ago in Israel. Because of their name, because of their religion, because of their background, they were being murdered, put in the oven, burned alive. And Paul writes to the church and says, guys, be encouraged. Be comforted with these words. Be extolled with these words. And so that being said, the people were dying prematurely. Stay with me. Think about how, where we were this time three years ago or two and a half years ago. Do you all, can I take you back just for a quick moment? I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm rushing here, but may I take you back two and a half years ago? Do you remember being glued to the TV set and seeing like everybody in the world was dying? You all remember that with COVID-19, don't you? Remember how the hospitals were over full, how, how people were having panic attacks and stress attacks, and there was not enough death beds for the people being buried? Remember how you almost literally had to sit here and hold your breath because it seemed like every other day someone you knew was dying? Well, that's how it was in the days of Thessalonians. Because there was, there was a, a tremendous uh, revolt from the Romans. Grecians were doing tremendous attacks on this church. And then you had your Judaizers, people like Paul. Remember Paul before he got saved? He roamed the earth killing Christians. That's the day they were living in. So now they have questions about what happens when a man dies? What happens when a man falls asleep? What happens if he don't come back tomorrow? That's the whole premise of First Thessalonians. I'm trying to kind of expedite through a little bit right now. So they get, if that wasn't enough, they get this ungodly heathen culture. Many problems arise, and there were so many misunderstandings. And so time and time again, you hear Paul say, be encouraged. I want to comfort you. I'm here to extol you. I'm here to strengthen you in the word. This morning, my sermon title was Encouraged for the Encore. 
encouraged for the encore. Not one, not two, but three different times. Paul says, encourage each other with these words. What words is he speaking of? That the return of Christ is near. And I can tell you right now, very few of us, I'm sure, probably don't walk around on our jobs and in our communities reminding people the return of the Lord is near. You know why? Because we don't have to believe that ourselves. And I'm going to be square with you and say this. I can understand why at times we can be so in love with this world, so in love with the things of the world, we, we fail to remember we are pilgrims passing through. You know, everybody wants to go to heaven. How many of y'all want to go to heaven? Well, everybody wants to go to heaven. Okay, how many of y'all want to go tomorrow? Well, you know, that's a whole other story. Well, I, I, I do really want to go, but, you know, kind of what happened was, you know. And so the reality is this. Are we a people ready? Are we a people who really believe in the scripture and the sanctity of scripture? So in the text this morning, in the text this morning, 1 Corinthians says we are to be encouraged. And not only we to be encouraged, I'm almost finished. Stay with me. Stay with me. I know you had a wonderful few days of all that food. And right now you are fooling about, you're about to fall over to the side. But hang in there about four or five more minutes, right? My goal today is that you be encouraged. You're already here. I'm so glad you're here today. I am so honored that you're in church this morning. But I need you to be encouraged. Because everything you're facing on your job. The things you're facing in your marriage, the things you're facing with your adult kids, the things that you're dealing with in your physical body. Be encouraged. Be comforted. It, there will come a day in time. None of these things will matter. I love what 1 Thessalonians 3 says. Verse 1, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. We sent Timothy, our brother, a minister of God and a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. And here's why we sent Pastor Tim. We wanted you to be encouraged in your faith, right? We wanted you to be encouraged so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. 1 Thessalonians Thessalonians 4 18 therefore comfort one another with these words now uh, we've got some some doctors and some PhDs and we, we, we've got some some folk with master's degree in the room I don't need to use them today to do this but the word encore it simply means and I got blessed when I thought when I read this word the word encore means a demand placed by the applause of an audience for a repeat appearance all right or repeat performance uh, if you've been to the plays in New York uh, if you've been to a great concert you know that a encore is when the performance or their appearance was so great your applause caused that curtain to be open again and caused a repeat visit or repeat performance and so I put the two together and said wow I think we could be encouraged because there's going to be a great encore one day there is going to be a revisit a reappearing and I don't know if the applause is praise or not whether you praise the Lord or not there is going to one day be a return of Christ the great rapturing of the church and I want to encourage you right now that yes heaven is real yes New Jerusalem will come and it will be a place where there's no no death it will be a place where there's no sorrow it will be a place where there's no pain and then you be encouraged by the encore revelations 22 and 20 he who testifies to these things says surely I am coming quickly amen even so come Lord Jesus uh, elder Rose sounds like an encore to me surely come Lord Jesus the world is being birthed through pain right now the things that we're seeing from in our country around the community even around the world we we are crying out even so come Lord Jesus if there's ever been an encore needed now is the day and time for that encore and so while we wait I'm gonna close with these three things while we wait for the encore of Christ would you say that with me the encore of Christ while we wait for the encore of Christ let me give you a couple of things you need to think about on your job tomorrow when you're out shopping this week when you're traveling throughout the holiday weekend. Number one, Paul says, talk to talk. Now, I don't know we call the talk to talk. Walk the walk, work the work, and have hope. Let's let me back up real quick. Talk the talk. He says, for we, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. See that? Asleep. Not dead, but asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, a voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Once again, he's giving you a commandment. Comfort another with these words. Mother, I know it's been tough. Young couple, I know you've gone through a lot of things. I know you've been aching in your body all these years. 
But let me encourage you. Let me comfort you that there will be a place where you'll experience no more heartbreak. There'll be a place where you'll experience no more pain. Let me encourage you and comfort you with these words. Oh, you were, you were denied or you were, you were backstabbed or you were talked about or you were ridiculed. But there will come a time and a place that there'll be no more of these things happening in your life. Someone say talk to talk. To me, talking to talk is encouraging one another. To me, talking to talk is to remind the world that this earth is not our home. We are pilgrims passing through. Number two, walk the wall. Let's stay in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before the Lord God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. I, I think I'll see right there. Let me read a bit further. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I write to you for you yourselves are taught by God to love love one another so it's not enough just to talk to talk Paul says walk to walk don't just be Sunday morning Christian only but when the time comes and the test is there learn how to love your brother love your sister all of the hate we're seeing in the world they say that black hate is up they say that Muslim hate is up those that are just political conversation because the reality is anti-semitism is up by 400 percent there is a hatred right now throughout the world that we've never seen if there's ever been a time please hear me right now all right if there's ever been a time for you to go the extra mile and show love first of all may it start in your home learn how to love your husband learn how to love your wife take time to love on your children go and love your enemy go and love those who despitefully use you if and how every opportunity you have show love be kind be courteous do everything you can do and if that ain't enough Paul says increase in uh, the ability of showing love there must be a situation and maybe I'm not doing it enough maybe I'm temperamental maybe I'm finicky maybe I get in my feelings too much but Paul says this is the time to walk the walk be people who love one another number three work to work remember what I said earlier now Thessalonians, they thought the rapture was going to happen in the day now, so they quit their jobs and they begin to beg and have handouts. And I said, oh, wow, what a day we're living in now. People want all of this empathy. People are looking for all this entitlement. People are looking for all these handouts. Go get a job. That's what Paul is basically saying. All right? I know you are so heavenly bound, but you're no earthly good. Uh, if your neighbor's kind of quiet right now, they might be the ones I'm talking about. Now, I'm not talking about those who retired. I'm not talking about those who put their time in. But for those who can't keep a job because of the white man. But they, I can't keep a job because of the system. When I supervised the on my last nerve. So I told her how I felt. And I went home to my unemployed husband and all my kids sitting there playing games all day long. Working on food stamps and government cheese. Get you a job and, and, and I, I don't, you don't like what I'm saying but I'm, I'm in the Bible right verse 10 and 12 but we urge you brethren that you should increase more and more that you also inspire to lead a quiet life and mind your own business don't nobody want to read the Bible when we read the Bible the Bible said come and look at your name and say the Bible says mind your own business you got more emphasis you got more concern in my world than you got in your own world you got more questions about what i'm doing than what you're doing you know we used to say it like this years ago with our business that we own you well, you're so busy counting my money you don't realize the money the increase you got in your own hand right mind your own business and if that wasn't enough paul said and work with your own hands mm -hmm. as we have commanded you Talk to talk, walk the walk, work the work, and as we're standing to our feet, have hope. Would you stand to your feet all over the church? Have hope. It's more than walking the walk and talking to talk. And I believe everybody should have a job in this earth, right? The Bible says if a man don't work, he is worse than an unbeliever. All of those tongues, all of those excuses, all those nice suits and alligator shoes, all that don't mean nothing if you can't put a good, hard day's earnest, hard days of work in. We are the generation where now we brag about telling folks we have it easy. We ain't do, man, I, I, man, how was your day, man? I got paid all day. I ain't do nothing all day, man. I had it easy. And we take pride in that. I like working hard. I like coming home and knowing that I put a good hard day's work in. It just makes me feel like I've contributed as a man of God. But Paul's whole ambition to the church of Thessalonica was simply for them to have hope. 
Hope is the expectation of fulfillment of something you desire. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the confidence of things we hope for, the evidence of things not seen. 1 Corinthians 15.19, for if in this life in Christ we only have hope, we are to be pitied more than all men. I read somewhere years ago that a man can go about 40 days without food. He can go 10 days without water. But he can't go one moment without hope. You have to have hope that whatever criticisms, whatever afflictions, whatever persecutions that you're going through right now, there is a place and there is a day where things will get better. You got to have a hope that throughout the barrage and onslaught of negative reports you've gotten from the doctor, things you've had to witness your family go through, struggles and wrestlings you've had to have in your own mind with no one else was around, you got to know that there is a day there is a time and there is a place. Paul says comfort and encourage each other with these words. I think we should get back into the business. We should get back into the business of encouraging one another. For the last several weeks, we've been glued to the TV, watching what's happening in Israel, watching what's happening in Gaza. And I rejoiced in the Lord when I seen them hostages being released. And I realized there's this few here and a few there and a few here, but man, I'll take anything we can get right now. And I'm not here to have no political conversation about this side or that side. All I know is that God arrives and his enemies be scattered. I like to start crying. When I seen that little nine-year-old boy run through that hospital to his loved ones, I like to start crying. I said, God, what would that have happened had that been your child? your nephew, your grandson. Have hope. And I know it looks bad. I know it looks horrible. And it looks overwhelming. But you got to be able to have hope that God is God. I went for a little walk this morning. All I can hear is Romans 4. I begin to hear so much I begin to quote it. The Bible says that Abraham did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief. But he was fully persuaded that everything that God had promised, that he would perform. I'm telling my family today as we sit down and talk at the family table, everything God promised, he's going to perform it. And I know it looks this way now. And I know it looks that way. And I know it's been a long drought. And I know we've had to go through the mountain highs and valley lows. And I know things have been topsy-turvy. And my God, it seems like the world turns its back. But he did not waver. Do you hear me? He did not waver at the promises of God through one belief. He was fully persuaded. Hallelujah. Fully persuaded that God was able to do everything that he promised. Paul tells the church, listen to these words closely in closing. He says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. You young Thessalonians, you and everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Extend from every form of evil. And I may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. I said, Lord, I want to be sanctified completely. I want to be sanctified all the way through. Set aside for his purposes and set away from the world systems. The Bible goes on to say that you may with your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who calls you is faithful and will do it. He who calls you is faithful and he will do it. I need every one of you to realize before I take my seat this morning that God is faithful over his promises. He's faithful over his word. To this young church, the Thessalonians, man, they were going through so much. So much worldliness, so much ungodliness on the outside and they were trying to fend for their lives on the inside. Christians and loved ones were being attacked and murdered and persecuted and, and martyred and dying. 
And he comforts them with these words. And so today I comfort you with these same words. We've gone through COVID. We've gone through this pandemic. There are earthquakes here and volcanoes there and seismic things happening all over the world. People are dying like flies. My God, and here we are still standing. You got to deal with your financials and then you got to go turn and deal with family and then you got to deal with stretching your faith for this and that and on top of that you're getting older and aging and you're trying to figure out what the rest is going to be like be encouraged god has a place and my god in that new jerusalem there is a stream that flows right down the middle in that new jerusalem my god the streets are yet of gold and the pearly gates are there and we will need no need for the bible says for the sun and the moon for the glory of god himself will be all of the light you need. You ain't got to go worry about going to premarital classes, going to five-year anniversary classes. The only marriage that will be concerned is the ultimate bride and the ultimate groom. In that place, there's no more sorrow. There's no more tears. There's no more sadness. Finally, you can now, if you live right, come on, tell your neighbor if you live right. Tell your neighbor if you live right. You'll be able to see some of your saved grandparents, your saved mama, your saved sister. Thank God, if you live right, there'll be a great reunion in the air. Hallelujah. To be encouraged by the encore. For he that shall come will come and not tarry. Thank you for watching Dr. Michael A. Stevens at City Church Northlake. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more encouraging and inspiring messages.